Hey guys, my name is Victor King, and today we'll be talking about the Quick Protocol um, and also a little about HTTP3 um, since the two are pretty interconnected. So why Quick? To understand this, um, we really need to kind of understand how HTTP has evolved over the years. And to do that, we will start with HTTP.9. This is kind of the, um, the HTTP in its infancy, and this is circa 1990. Uh, anyway, it was extremely simple. Request consisted of a single line. It's really only a possible to use a GET method. Uh, and it really was just to transmit HTML files. You know, fast forward to HTTP 1, uh, we get versioning information sent with each request. We have addition of a status code, um, which allows the browser to determine the success or failure of a request. Uh, we have this concept of HTTP headers, which are introduced for requests and responses. Metadata can be transmitted, which makes a protocol more flexible. And we have these uh, nifty content type headers, which allow us to send other documents to just plain HTML. Finally, fast forward again, and now we finally have a standardized protocol uh, for HTTP with 1.1. Um, and persistent HTTP is introduced. Uh, that means basically the connection can be reused. Pipelining is added, which means you can um, send requests before you receive a response. Uh, we have chunk responses, which basically using uh, HTTP range to get a particular piece of an object on the server. Um, we have content negotiation, which is essentially when the server and the client agree on language and coding and type, which makes things much more cohesive. And then finally, we have uh, the introduction of what are called host headers, which allow for server co-location, which is basically when you have a single IP address that uh, has multiple uh, domains within it. Finally, fast forward one more time to um, HTTP2, which is kind of where we are present day. Um, and HTTP2 offers binary rather than text-based protocol, which has obvious optimizations. Uh, it's a multiplex protocol, and we can send parallel requests over the same connection. Uh, it compresses headers and you know, removes some of the duplication uh, when we transmit. And then it has this idea of server pushes, which kind of uh, goes against what's conventional, where normally the client requests from the server, but now we can actually push from the server to the client. So um, you know, now that we kind of understand where HTTP has been, we can kind of understand why we need uh, quick. And the reason is, is because there's still some problems with HTTP2. HTTP and namely, these are connection establishment time, uh, TCP head of line blocking, and server load spikes. So with connection time establishment, um, basically, HTTP2 requires that we use some level of TLS, and it's at least TLS 1.2. And that adds additional complexity when we are doing our handshake with the server to establish our connection. So uh, with more complexity uh, means um, more time to complete and higher latency. Um, with TCP head of, head of line blocking, um, inherent in the TCP protocol itself, in this case with HTTP, HTTP2, since we're multiplexing over a single connection, if we lose packets or the connection is interrupted, then um, the connection cannot continue to transmit uh, data until they basically accounted for that packet. It's been resent, um, and then they can continue um, using that connection. Um, server load spikes, this is actually um, something I was reading from Lucid chart, but um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the company, but basically uh, whenever they swapped over to HTTP2, um, instead of you know, decreased uh, server load and uh, faster response times, they saw the opposite and they were confused as to why. But uh, on further digging, they found out that basically when they transferred from HTTP 1.1 to 2, 1.1 is kind of inherently serial in its request, but with uh, 2, um, you can use this multiplexing to send a lot more requests a lot faster. And it's not really something they were expecting. And, it, apparently, the way that it is with TCP, a lot of it's inherent in the protocol, and it required a lot more um, work on their part to adjust their load balancers to accommodate this. So now that we understand the problems, uh, we can understand why and how HTTP3 and QUIC aim to uh, overcome those with a brief overview. And just as a quick aside, I kind of want to explain what QUIC means. It really stands for QUIC UDP Internet Connections, which I think is kind of relevant. Um, so now let's dive into the architecture. So here uh, on the left side, we have kind of HT HTTP um, as it was original um, with uh, HTTP application layer and then in the transport layer with uh, TCP and then TLS sitting on top of that encrypting um, transmissions. Now with uh, QUIC, we have a major difference right off the bat. We can see that instead of TCP, we're using UDP. So um, different transport layer protocol altogether. And then we also noticed that TLS, rather than being another piece, is actually embedded in QUIC. So we have embedded and inherent uh, security with QUIC, which is pretty nice. Um, finally, what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that QUIC 
kind of takes parts from the application layer and uh, the transport layer, or what at least TCP was providing, um, and, and uh, embodies that in its own protocol. So here we see stream multiplexing is kind of engulfed, uh, congestion control, connection orientation, and reliability are all now part of QUIC, whereas they used to be in different protocols. So it's kind of this uh, hybrid, if you will, in between the application and transport layer. And just some highlights, um, it has faster handshaking, uh, existing connections are really no longer required to set up communication channels, has improved error handling, flexible congestion control, and the encryption is built in as we kind of already touched on. So now uh, I want to bring our attention to one of the, the kind of highlights of, of QUIC, and it's this idea of zero connection uh, or zero RTT connection establishment. So uh, here in the very extreme left, we see that this is just traditional TCP, and we had three-way handshake, as we'd expect. And then with TCP and TLS, we have all this other stuff that has to happen before we can actually start transmitting data down here. Um, and that's kind of due to the added security and integration of TLS. But with QUIC, we can see that we literally can transmit data after one, uh, one request or one interaction with the server, we can start transmitting data, which is amazing. And it really reduces uh, the latency associated. So um, now I want to talk about uh, we kind of touched on multiplexing before, but now I want to show you guys what really the difference is between uh, what QUIC provides and then what we have currently. So with HTTP2, it's nice because we can still multiplex, um, you know, but it's over one connection. So if anything happens to this connection, then the connection itself is going to be clogged or blocked until we can, you know, retransmit that file and clear uh, the blockage. But with QUIC, since we have these multiple streams that are operating independently inside of a, a broader connection, even if something happens to one of the streams, then you know we're still free to transmit on the other streams, and we can just kind of kibosh that and then make a, a new stream to replace it. Um, you know, also too with Quick, we have um, congestion control uh, and flow control that are stream um, independent. I guess you could say, or, or they are they are at the stream level. So each stream is uh, independently manages that. So, you know, that's, that's a really nice feature as well. And then finally, before we leave the slide, I just want to touch on, you know, the server spike that I talked about earlier. And it's unclear why Quick doesn't, or Quick and HTTP3 don't really have this as an issue, but I think it's probably because of the way that they handle flow control and uh, congestion control at the individual um, stream level. And also because those are built into the Quick protocol. They're not um, kind of inherent or baked in like they are with with TCP in the sense that, you know, TCP didn't know about these problems, so they couldn't correct them. And it's much harder for um, the end servers they interact with to kind of fix all these problems in this with, with, with QUIC. Okay, finally, I want to revisit server push and uh, explain how it's different with QUIC and HTTP, HTTP3. Um, you know, conventionally, the client really had no say as to whether it was going to accept the push or not, but now the client does because the server will ask the client, basically, it will, it will send a push promise frame, which basically says, hey, this is what we're going to send you. This is what it looks like. And then the client can decide, hey, I like that, or no, I don't. And if they don't like it, they can send back a cancel push, which will basically tell the server, hey, don't send me that. I don't want it. Finally, um, we'll do some moving to some technical highlights. And I want to uh, express here that these are highlights more of the quick protocol and not really HTTP3. However, they are closely related, as we've said, since HTTP is kind of built on uh, quick, but these are pertaining specifically to quick. But I really want to highlight the connection establishment because this is one of the the the, the main uh, selling points of quick. So well, we'll start here with this one RTT handshake, which is basically what has to happen in order for us to make it to zero RTT handshake. Um, kind of initializing everything so we can get here. Um, but so we'll start here at the left. And initially, the client has no information about the server. Before a handshake can be attempted, the client sends in uh, in co client hello here um, to the server to elicit and basically kind of force um, a rejection response because it contains a lot of useful information, such as a server config, uh, a certificate chain, a signature, um, source address token, and a bunch of other stuff that's really necessary. Um, and then the client basically hangs onto this and then sends it back to the server later so it can demonstrate ownership of its own IP. Um, once the client has received a server config, it authorizes or authenticates rather the config by verifying the certificate chain and signature. It then sends a complete CHLO, so right here, um, containing the client's ephemeral Diffie Hellman public value. After sending the complete CHLO, the client is in possession of the initial keys for connection since it can calculate the shared value from the server's long term Diffie Hellman public value and its own ephemeral Diffie Hellman private key. 
at this point, the client is now free to start sending uh, application data to the server. Um, and in fact, it actually has to if it wants to take advantage of the zero RTT latency uh, for data. Um, and basically, it's going to send that data under the assumption that the handshake is successful. Um, and then once that handshake is successful, the server returns a server hello, um, uh, an SHLO message. This message is encrypted using the initial keys and contains the server's Diffie or ephemeral Diffie Hellman public value. And now that we've got both those in hand, both sides can calculate the final or forward secure keys for connection. Um, upon sending an SHLO message, the server will immediately switch over to sending packets. And then upon receiving, the client will do the same. Um, and I just want to touch quickly on these kind of two different levels of cryptography that Quick, Quick has. Quick has. Um, and uh, one is basically the, when, when the initial client data is encrypted using the initial keys, it's kind of like a TS session level uh, encryption with session tickets. And then once uh, you know, they kind of uh, both receive that SHLO message, uh, they can start using the forward secure keys, which are much, uh, much more secure. Um, and then once all this has happened, the client can cache the server config and the address token, so it doesn't have to repeat this anymore. And then we can really move into uh, just using the zero RTT handshake. However, eventually the you know source address token or server config might expire, or maybe um, the server makes changes to the certificate, um, and that results in handshake failure. And then we move on to this kind of rejected state. And basically, I'm not going to go through that, but essentially, when this happens, we have to go back and then re. Uh, initialize with the one RTT handshake again before we can start uh, moving into the zero. Um, so I think this is a really uh, neat way to handle and uh, kind of improve the connection establishment time. And I think it was a really nice, elegant solution. I also want to touch on stream multiplexing. Um, quick streams are lightweight and they provide reliable bidirectional byte stream. Streams can be used for framing applications that are really big, up to two to the uh, 64 bytes, but are also still lightweight enough that they can. Um, send series of small messages. Um, they're identified by particular IDs, odd for clients, even for server, and that's kind of to reduce the collisions between them. Um, stream creation is implicit. Stream closing is indicated by a fin bit on the last frame. And this is nice because we don't have to have any other um, transmissions that are associated with creating and closing like we do with traditional TCP. Um, and Quick also does not retransmit data for a stream. So rather it'll just cancel it and then reopen another one and figure out where they're at. Um, and endpoints now have to decide how they want to kind of uh, partition that bandwidth because now we have multiple streams inside of a connection and we need to figure out how to partition you know, X bandwidth between multiple streams. Also, I think it's worth taking a look at the packet structure. Um, and really what I want y'all to get out of this is the fact that with Quick, every time that we can encrypt something, we do. So that every, this is here in green is encrypted and this in red is authenticated but not encrypted. But the only reason that this is left unencrypted is because we actually have to have this information so that we either can uh, figure out where the packet is going or we can encrypt um, and decrypt the packet. And then finally, I really like the way that they handle loss recovery um, because you know TCP has this uh, thing called inherent or retransmission ambiguity and it's inherent to TCP. But basically what that means is um, whenever we have to retransmit a packet, we can't really inherently tell whether it's original or not uh, without TCP acts. So um, with Quick, each packet carries a new packet number and it avoids the need for the separate mechanism. Um, another really neat, neat thing is we have stream offsets um, in stream frames, and those are used for uh, delivery ordering. And there's also packet numbers, which represent an explicit time ordering. And both of those together um, enables a simpler and more accurate loss detection TCP. Um, Quick acknowledgments explicitly encode the delay between uh, the receipt of a packet and its acknowledgement being sent. And so those together with the monotonically increasing packet numbers allow for really precise uh, and accurate RTT estimation. And you know that can actually aid in loss detection. So with those accurate RTT estimates, uh, we can also um, aid in delay sensing congestion controllers. Finally, Quick's acknowledgement support, um, it's, sorry, it supports up to 256 ACK blocks, which makes Quick really resilient uh, to reordering and uh, loss as opposed to TCP. And finally, all this together uh, means that Quick can keep more bytes on the wire uh, in the presence of reordering or loss. So now let's evaluate this. Um, and I wanna use the same metrics that the kind of the paper that underpins this uses. And the paper is the Quick Transport Protocol Design Internet Scale Deployment. Um, and the key, uh, they use three key metrics that I wanna use as well. And those are search latency, video playback latency, and video rebuff rate. And um, 
So the way that they kind of gauged this is they showed uh, Quick's performance impact as a percent reduction between TLS, TCP, uh, and using Quick. So that's actually this on the right axis, or uh, sorry, the Y axis. And to get an example of this for clarity, um, if Quick decreased search latency from 100 to 99 uh, seconds, then it would be a 1% reduction. Um, and what I really want us to get out of this is the fact that Quick performed better in every count than traditional uh, TCP, um, whether that's search latency, video latency, rebuff rate, um, you know, it was better on all accounts and significantly better with search latency and rebuff rate. I also, since we've talked a lot about the handshake, I wanted to kind of quantify that uh, for everyone. And um, down here in this solid line, it is all RTT connections. This is um, uh, RTT connections that are do not include those zero RTT connections we talked about before. And then this is the baseline TCP. And what we can see is that no matter whether we include or don't include those zero zero RTT connections, the handshake latency is significantly less for quick in either case. And then finally, I just found this really interesting. Um, this is network characteristics of selected countries. They use South Korea, USA, and India. And uh, we can see that for percent reduction in search latency and percent reduction in rebuff rate, that it was uh, improved across the board. So the latency was reduced across the board for desktop and mobile. Finally, uh, I just want to leave you guys with my thoughts on the future of QUIC uh, and HTTP3. And, you know, really, QUIC clearly provides many great benefits, um, you know, over its predecessors. In fact, um, it was recently, um, you know, formalized as RFC 9000. Um, and HTTP3, while it's still in the draft stage, is edging closer uh, to full RFC status itself. And, you know, to me, it's clear and that kind of indicates that HTTP3 is here to stay and um, Quick is as well. And there will both be strong know. players in the internet's future uh, in the years to come, especially as this ecosystem continues to fully develop. Finally, uh, I just wanna leave um, everyone with my references and I wanna give credit where credit is due. Um, so I also want to thank everyone for listening and hope you have a great rest of your day.